welcome to Maintaining Positivity, the podcast that looks at the headlines about health and fitness and digs deeper to look at the research behind the headlines. I'm your host, Brianna Bertolio, and I will help you separate the clickbait from the information you can use to live a healthier life. Welcome everyone to episode four, self-monitoring or tracking food to lose weight, why you should and why you shouldn't. I want to thank everyone who downloaded my previous episode, but please continue to share, like, review, and subscribe. That really makes my day. And uh, for the kind and helpful feedback, uh, it's weird how I actually appreciate the feedback I'm getting. I feel like so often in my career, I've uh, disagreed with the feedback given in either the content or I question the motivation of the person giving it, which then made me nervous that I was a narcissist. But then narcissists don't generally question whether they are one. Uh, Anyway, a, uh, a person who is an expert in the audio arts who, um, this is probably not accurate, it's almost definitely not, but I will label a bureau chief for an NPR station in a mid-sized Midwestern city, and she gave me really, um, some really specific feedback that I, uh, not only did I feel, like, not defensive about, I genuinely appreciated, and I will try to implement her suggestions as much as I can, so maybe I'm not a monster, and can take criticism when I respect the expertise and intent of the person giving it. Hmm. That's, that's wild. Um, okay. Okay. <clears throat> Before we begin, I'd like to give a content warning. Um, I will briefly be discussing eating disorders, uh, but not in a super after school special way, not like gross or detail ridden, but I can't talk about something that might be triggering for some folks without talking about it, so I will talk about that later on. Okay, so I'm going to discuss a New York Times article that made the rounds on social media early in 2018 and how this article really grinds my gears. And after I discuss it, it might grind your gears as well. But before I get to it, I'm going to give some background information and discuss some studies before I tackle the actual article and the study it was based on. Um, I might seem to meander a bit, but I I promise I will get us there. Um, So I'm talking about tracking, food tracking, because It is a part of a cadre of habits reported by people in the NWCR. So remember, we are looking at the findings of the NWCR because it is made up of people who have lost a substantial amount of weight, but more importantly, have maintained it for a substantial amount of time. So these practices are really the antidote to the crash diet. Um, Which, not not the... uh, not the, the movie that won Oscars, bizarrely, even though it shouldn't have. Um, no. Uh, you know, those things that everyone knows are snake oil, but they chase nonetheless. So, crash diets, you know, cabbage f- uh, soup diet, you know, a cleanse, which is a crash diet with a fancy story made up about it. Uh, again, probably... Uh, uh, it's a uh, totes okay because no one needs to be a professional in order to give out medical information. Uh, thank you, Supreme Court. Um, so the crash diet I made up called the no food that was featured on the HBO series The Sopranos and The Wire. Like, oh no, I can't eat that. Omar ate that season one. Or, oh no, I can't eat that. Tony ate that while he was on a date with his mistress. I mean, that would be a great crash diet. I think I would make a lot of money if I marketed that. And so, the, you know, they are the equivalent to feeling cold um, and setting your coffee table on fire. You know, you're super warm for a while. Um, then you go right back to feeling cold. But now you have no coffee table. 
So you buy another coffee table, only to set it on fire, too. You know, and this is expensive, and you spend most of your time cold. And it takes a toll on the rest of your house. This is misery-inducing, money-wasting, and just doesn't work. So looking at the NWCR is like learning about how to weatherize your house, get better insulation, install a heating system. They're bigger investments, but they have the advantage of actually working and not destroying your life. So um, the NWCR finding um, is that 98% of, of registry participants report that they modified their food intake in some way to lose weight. Uh, so this means a lot of different things. Uh, one of the interesting findings of the NWCR is that there are multiple successful plans used by people, lots of different paths. But some of the common habits are what we're focusing on. So previously I looked at the fact that 78% ate breakfast regularly, and the episode before that looked at the role exercise plays in weight loss um, and maintenance, which is relevant because 90% exercise on average one hour per day. So this 98% who modified their food intake did so in many different ways. You know, and one strategy might be that they purchase a system where you are assigned food and eat only that food. Um, you know, and they manufacture it and you just purchase it from them. Uh, you know, and one is, you know, you to eliminate whole food groups like no, like the no fat diets of the 80s and 90s, or you know, low carb, no sugar, no grains, no animal products, only foods that can be found in the Bible. Um, that's a real thing. That's not one of my silly jokes. That's an actual legit Bible. You know, and actually, you could you could do a lot worse than just eating food in the Bible. You know, there's some there's some good food in there. Um, or you know, no foods from The Sopranos and The Wire. And that's not a real thing. I mean, at least not yet. And uh, often these strategies work in the short term because they do cause a caloric deficit but either are not personally sustainable or the market shifts to accommodate people with a surplus of high calorie products. In other words, um, you know, like I, I, I remember some gals in college who were vegan but wore leather jackets and they uh, used to have eating disorders in high school. Uh, and I, I don't know for a fact that they weren't personally um, invested in the ethical and environmental aspects of veganism. I don't claim to know what was in their hearts or heads. But I, I felt like there was some room for doubt, and I do wonder if they are still vegan now, uh, especially now that there are so many more options than there were in the mid to late 90s. The excuse of, I can't eat in front of you because I'm vegan, doesn't fly for people who live in you know reasonably large urban settings anymore. Um, I wonder if a new dietary philosophy has taken its place that explains why, uh, why you know why you like I can't eat in front of you. Um, I don't know, and I I, mean, I don't mean um, like a lack of to, I'm not, not that I don't respect them or, or vegans. I just wonder about how the, the moving target of the market's response to eating trends affects the choice and successes of any given way of eating. You know, the fallacy of extreme low-fat eating was definitely brought to the surface with a little product called Snackwell's Cookies. You know, in other words, the market made it too easy to eat low-fat, so overconsumption of calories became easy. Um, Another strategy of modifying uh, food intake is self-monitoring in the form of tracking. You know, and some people uh, track uh, so-called like macros, like protein, carbs, and fats, with the idea that they can have um, a certain number of each per day. And uh, how similar does that sound to the old Richard Simmons deal and meal system? Which I think we should just bring that back, you know, and Richard Simmons too. Um, you know, so some people track 
points like in Weight Watchers where different foods are assessed a point value based on a few factors including protein, sugar, and saturated fat. Um, the end result is pretty similar to calorie counting but is also about sort of shifting eating towards more generally healthy foods and building sustainable habits. Um, there's also straight up just calorie counting and just recording foods with without a formal assessment of caloric value and you know and kind of we'll be circling back to that later on but you know there's sort of understanding of just just by recording something there's the possibility um, of lim that by having to record it you end up doing less or more depending on what the monitoring is tracking so so just uh, a quick clarification, I'm, go I'm going to be using the term self-monitoring and tracking. And tracking of food is a specific type of self-monitoring. Other, other kinds of self-monitoring are like weighing the body um, and tracking activity like um, with pedometers or Fitbits. And self-monitoring is a, definitely akin to um, the observer effect, which is something that in physics basically means the act of observing affects the outcome. Uh, this effect is really amplified when filtered through the human brain. Simply monitoring how many steps you take in a day often means that you'll walk more steps, often unconsciously, without even trying to modify how many steps you take. So, you know, really keep that in mind. Just the presence of this, this observation, um, you know, affects the outcome. You know, you, you may not like someone might have like a, a step goal for a day or they might be given a step goal you know by somebody else but even if they don't have that the awareness is going to generally increase the output um, so one common habit of self-monitoring is in the for form of food track tracking um, so it, sorry tracking food intake um, Okay, so um, in this study I'm going to look at, um, Wing and Hill, 2001, entitled Successful Weight Loss Maintenance, uh, which was in the Annual Review of Nutrition. Again, remember all, all the citations will be in the show notes if you want to look any of these up. Um, so they were looking into NWCR data for specific habits associated with weight maintenance. Uh, I'm going to read a, a, a portion. Um, Self-monitoring may be viewed as one component of the more general construct of cognitive restraint, i.e. the degree of conscious control one exerts over eating behaviors on the three-factor eating scale. Registry members report high levels of dietary restraint, similar to the levels reported by patients who have recently completed uh, treatment for obesity, though not nearly as high as the level seen in eating disordered patients. Uh, these data suggest that successful maintainers produce long term, uh, continue long term to, to use behavior change strategies taught in weight loss programs. However, why some individuals can persist in conscious control of intake, whereas others revert back to old habits, is unclear. Self-monitoring has been recognized as a useful behavior during weight loss and data obtained by the NWCR suggests that this is a useful behavior to continue during weight maintenance. They cite um, Guerre et al.'s 1980 study that looked at factors that help um, patients with type 2 diabetes and recording food intake was a factor associated with improved outcomes. 1989 is a ways back, uh, but old studies aren't necessarily bad to look at because research priorities go in and out of fashion. And uh, the point is the fact that recording food intake is associated with better outcomes. You know, that was established a while ago, and this information was widely disseminated. Every woman's health or beauty magazine includes it as a tip, you know. Trying to lose weight by a beach this season, recorded in a food journal. You know, um, that kind of thing. Um, so doctors recommended it, commercial diet companies uh, recommended it, you know, it received popular and critical acclaim, you know, like the Titanic of research findings. I mean, the movie, like not, not the actual Titanic. I meant the movie because, you know, like it, 
won a lot of awards and it was really successful. Anyway, um, just a reminder that um, in the show notes, there's a, a link for the Google Docs with citations for all the articles discussed here. Um, I use things that are available to the public and with my library card, which by the way is a very strange and complicated path um, to access databases and get articles. It, you know, it's like witchcraft, but I, I work ha hard at it. Um, so, and through other means that you don't need to know and I don't need to say. Let's just say there are places, I'm not going to call it the dark web, but just there are places you can find articles um, outside of channels where you have to pay a lot of money. I'm not, that's all I'm going to say. Y you can look things up if you need to. Okay, so let's time travel t to a 2006 study by Kruger, Blanc, and Gillespie. Gillespie. Um, dietary and physical activity among adults successful at weight loss maintenance in the International Journal of Behavioral Nutrition and Physical Activity. So the background was that there, um, I'll just read an excerpt for this. It says, there is a limited population-based data on behavioral factors found to be important for successful weight loss maintenance among adults. And I am interjecting and saying, I think, um, y the shift towards studying maintenance is a fairly recent shift in a lot of this research. Um, I would say within the last 10 years is where we're seeing an emphasis on actually looking at maintenance. Um, prior to that, it was really like, how much can you lose? Which, you know, if you've listened to my prior um, podcast, it gets, a, gets you kind of into that ca um, territory of, of the high school wrestler who has to cut weight for, for a meet. You know, I think the whole research field was really obsessed with the actual losing of weight and really was not looking at um, long-term effects. And I think still that mentality is, prevails. Okay, anyway, um, their methods um, are data from a 2004 um, surveys mailed to U.S. adults. Um, who are older than 18. It was used to examine the difference in selected weight loss strategies and attitudes among persons who reported successful weight loss attempts, lost weight, and able to keep it off, and persons who were not successful. Previous attempts to lose weight were unsuccessful or they could not keep the lost weight off. Behaviors examined um, included modification of diet, leisure time and sports activities, and self-monitoring, and barriers to weight management. Significantly more successful versus unsuccessful weight um, losers reported that on most days of the week, they planned meals, tracked calories, tracked fat, and measured food on the plate. Successful losers were also more likely to weigh themselves daily. There were a significantly higher proportion of successful losers who reported lifting weights. So again, self-monitoring for the win. Also, lifting weights. Please go listen to episode two, where I, I really dig into exercise and its role in weight maintenance. And uh, some particularly uh, gear-grinding uh, articles that say the contrary that I dig into. All right, so what is interesting is um, this. Factors which are commonly recommend, um, recommended, they did not find differences, significant differences. And those were, um, so the five most common weight control behaviors did not differ significantly between successful and unsuccessful weight losers, uh, which is to reduce the amount of food consumed, more fruits and vegetables, smaller portions, and fewer fatty foods, and no sweetened beverages. So what's, what is interesting is that tracking is helpful, but not the intention to reduce caloric intake. Tracking calories helps, trying to reduce not so much. So, I mean, that suggests to me there's something sort of interesting going on cognitively. If recording something helps you, but having the intention of eating, of just consuming less does not, um, I think that's a really interesting area to explore. Um, so this brings me to a literature review. Um, 
by Burke, Wang, and Savick in 2011. And so they, uh, this review includes articles that were published between 1993 and 2009 that reported on the relationship between weight loss and self-monitoring strategies. Of the 22 studies identified, 14 focused on dietary self-monitoring, one on self-monitoring exercise, and six on self-weighing. A wide array of methods um, were used uh, to perform self-monitoring. The paper diary was used most often. And then in conclusion, they found that although there were methodological limitations to the studies reviewed, there was ample evidence for the consistent and significant positive relationship between self-monitoring diet, physical activity or weight, and successful outcomes related to weight management. So basically, they're saying, we looked at a ton of research and self-monitoring is super important. It's statistically significant uh, across the board. It's important. Um, you know, and then the authors speculated that advances in technology will make them easier for people in the future. And certainly, you know, in 2011, they probably couldn't imagine how widespread smartphone usage would be. And I mean, because I mean, you think about, well, 2011 wasn't that far ago, but you know, if you're listening to this right now, this is 2018, and seven years ago, you did not have the kind of um, saturation of smartphone usage. Um, you know, some of the studies, because they started in 93, so obviously they ended, in, their cutoff was 2009. Um, iPhones came out in, what, 2008? So, although, you know, they're in the internet era in the 2000s, um, so there were some systems available at the time for, um, you know, using, like, uh, on, online diaries to record food. You know, they would, a lot of the options we have now which would not have been available back then. Um, so just, that's important to keep in mind. This was how, this was successful even with people mostly writing things down, which I don't think would be, I don't think that'd be the case for most people now. Um, all right, so now we arrive at a recent 2017 study, which is Sawamoto et al., and it's called Predictors of Long-Term Weight Loss Maintenance, a Two-Year Follow-Up. And I love a follow-up study. I love words like year in, conjun in conjunction with studies because, as I've said previously, so often the effects of habit changes on people, either biologically or cognitively, uh, can't be seen in scales of weeks um, or even months. It can really take years. Um, and that's how most studies are. Like They are looking at the scale of weeks. This study has a lot of interesting results, um, but I'm only focusing on one of their chief findings, but you know, you're welcome to read the rest, of course. The study is not looking at self-monitoring per se, but I think the results may be illuminating in terms of how self-monitoring might work. Um, so in this study, they said the identific identification of factors that predict which patients will successfully maintain weight loss or who are at risk to, of weight gain after weight loss intervention is necessary to improve the current weight loss, weight maintenance strategies. The aim of the present study is to identify factors associated with successful weight loss maintenance by women um, with overweight or obesity who completed group cognitive behavioral treatment or CBT for weight loss. So um, the, their participants are people who um, lost at least 10% of their initial weight during the weight loss intervention and had maintained the loss um, for at least uh, 24 months follow-up. Um, those are the people who were designed, who were defined as successful. Um, so in their treatment, um, I'll just read from it again. Our treatment program was conducted in small groups, approximately 10 people, it consisted of 40 group ses sessions, 30 sessions for the weight loss phase, and 10 sessions for the weight maintenance phase, each lasting 90 minutes, and five individual sessions over a 44-week period. The sessions were con conducted once a week for the first 34 sessions, with the remaining four uh, held every other week. 
the healthcare providers were two physicians who are fully qualified psychotherapists with specialized treatment or training in uh, CBT and two certified nutritionists. In the weight loss phase, all participants receive a common CBT. They were instructed to keep a food diary to track their consumption of all food and drinks, ding, 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 and to record their daily number of steps from pedometer. Ding, 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 ding. They were also advised to reduce their dietary intake by 500 calories per day from their caloric intake at the beginning of therapy. Uh, the nutrition, <coughs> excuse me, the nutritionist checked the nutritional balance of the participants' di- diets by examining their food intake diaries and advised the participants about the importance of eating vegetables and reducing uh, the consumption of fatty foods and sweets. The participants were advised to increase their physical their level of physical exercise to a moderate intensity, such as walking eight to 10,000 steps per day by the end of seven weeks. Furthermore, a series of lectures on stress management was conducted over eight sessions that included co- cognitive restructuring, problem solving, and assertion training. The results were the intervention was successful for 30% and unsuccessful for 70%. And the conclusion was that participants who have a tendency towards disinhibition of food addiction are vulnerable to regaining weight after intervention. The lower levels of disinhibition and food addiction at the end of the weight loss intervention predicted successful weight loss maintenance. So what does this mean? Uh, the three factors eating questionnaire, the TFEQ, which is a 51 I- item um, uh, test or you know survey, and it consists of three eating behavior factors: restraint, which was mentioned earlier in the study on the NWCR, disinhibition, and hunger. Restraint refers to the tendency of some people to restrict food intake in order to control their their body weight. Disinhibition is overconsumption of food in response to a variety of stimuli, including um, such as emotions or alcohol. Hunger refers to food intake in response for feelings and perceptions of hunger. So, like I said, the earlier study I mentioned before um, showed that restraint was an important factor, and this one is finding disinhibition. So, um, now the people in the study learned many different CBT tools. They also learned about self-monitoring in the form of food diaries that they kept you know and let me be clear this is me drawing a line of connection in the research Um, self-monitoring particularly food tracking is well established to associate um, as as well as associate getting tangled in my words is well established um, you know that is that is associated with weight maintenance so perhaps the mechanism is related to increasing um, disinhibition which is, you know, a lot of, uh, it's a lot of dis in, yeah, it's a lot. Um, in other words, creating a, a way to address the stimuli of emotions and alcohol. So perhaps the act of um, recording in a food diary is inhibiting, like how spending cash can be inhibiting in a way that using you a know, credit card isn't. It makes something concrete. You know, in the Huffington Post article, uh, Food Diary, Why This Weight Loss Tactic is So Effective, by registered dietitian Kristen uh, Kirkpatrick, uh, she explains that her clients often claim to eat nothing at all, but when she has them keep a food diary, they are shocked by their intake. She highlights the reasons um, that this um, that, um, come up, such as uh, portion size, grazing, and fluids. Uh, oh, sorry, fluid calories. Uh, the food diaries make people aware of their portion size, grazing habits, and uh, liquid calories. Um, and just that awareness can cause a reduction in unnecessary calorie intake. 
um, just externalizing those behaviors can make them easy to remedy. I mean, when you realize that you know twenty percent of your calories are coming from like soda, that that's a fairly painless thing to give up. I mean, it might be painful, um, you know, for whatever. Like, if you really love your afternoon soda, but like, it might also not be that painful because it, you just had no idea that you were consuming that much. Um, or just having that awareness again, it can make that make a lot of those behaviors sort of go away fairly easily. Um, so yeah, the awareness can produce a reduction in unnecessary calorie intake just by externalizing those behaviors. It makes them easy to remedy, um, and then it can work as a more pinpoint tool by showing connections to stress and emotion, timing and location, and, you know, like diagnosing those triggers and addressing them. Um, so that sounds like addressing disinhibitions to me by creating, you know, some inhibitions. So like, you know, for example, you know that like you uh, tend to eat a lot after visiting your family or after, you know, your all staff meeting, you always tend to, to eat more. Knowing those, uh, that those are triggers might, might, um, create the opportunity to create a strategy to address the emotions that are coming up and maybe not use food to cope with those emotions and use different, um, strategy. Okay, so now I am shifting gears to talk about the 2018 New York Times article. But it's hard with my gears grinding so hard. You might remember this piece making the rounds on social media back in February of 2018. Oh, the New York Times. The Nicolas Cage of periodicals. I thought they were both pretty great back in the early 2000s. Anyway, this article is called, The Key to Weight Loss is Diet Quality, Not Quantity, A New Study Finds, by Anahad O'Connor. <sighs> so, if you listen to my episode on exercise and weight, you'll hear me criticizing um, a Vox and uh, a WAPO article because I think they only discuss part of the research findings and not a broader picture. Um, but I, I, I do think they, what they said is not necessarily wrong or actually, or even bad to bring up the point that they're bringing up. Uh, but with this article, I am truly baffled as to how a person came to this takeaway from the research based on. O'Connor is reporting on a JAMA article uh, called Effect of Low Fat versus Carbohydrate Diet on 12 Month Weight Loss in Overweight Adults and the Association with a Genotype Pattern or Insulin Secretion, the Diet Fits Randomized Clinical Trial. Whew, that was a doozy. Uh, basically, this is a study that, you know, uh, looking at what's better, a low-fat or a low-carb go low carb diet, and does it matter about certain genotypes, or how does this affect insulin, blah, 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 like, what's better? So this is probably ringing some bells. You might remember headlines like, low-fat and low-carb have same results, um, sort of things along those lines. So... This headline is um, The Key to Weight Loss is Diet Quality, Not Quantity, A New Study Finds. And at first I think, well, the article, you know, author doesn't always pick the headline and maybe this article is more nuanced when you actually, you know, get into it. Anyone who has ever been on a diet knows that the standard prescription for weight loss is to reduce the amount of calories you consume. But a new study um, trigger in published it Tuesday in JAMA may turn that advice on its head. It found that people who cut back on added sugar, refined greens, and highly processed foods, while concentrating on eating plenty of vegetables and, all fo- and whole foods, without worrying about calories or limiting portion sizes, lost significant amounts of weight over the course of a year. 
that the strategy worked for people whether they followed diets that were mostly low in fat or mostly low in carbohydrates, and their success did not appear to be influenced by their genetics or their insulin response to carbohydrates, a finding that cast doubt on the increasingly popular idea that diets um, should be recommended to people based on their DNA or their tolerance for carbs or fat. The research lends a strong support to the notion that diet quality not quantity, is what helps people lose and manage their weight most easily in the long run. It also suggests that health authorities should shift away from telling the public to obsess over calories, instead encourage Americans to avoid processed foods that are made with refined starches and added sugar, like bagels, white bread, refined flour, and sugary snacks and beverages said Dr. Darayesh uh, Muzaff Muzaffarian, a cardiologist and dean of the Freeman School of Nutrition Science and Policy at Tufts University. This is the roadmap to reducing the obesity epidemic in the United States, um, said Dr. Muzaff Muzaffarian, who was not involved in the new study. It's time for the U.S. and other national um, policies to stop focusing on calories and calorie counting. So, the author isn't lying exactly, but I find this takeaway baffling. The study found that low-carb and low-fat diets and genotypic markers don't seem to matter. Um, those were the study's conclusions. Nowhere in the JAMA article is there any discussion of diet quality and its effects. Like, I'm not saying Dean at Tufts is wrong. Like, I don't think he's wrong. But I am saying that it is a conclusion that he is drawing and not the authors of the study being cited. Okay? Um, and, you know, I, I'll talk about it more later, but I just really find, you know, so it's saying quality and not quantity of calories. I just, just keep that in mind as I read on. Um, I'm going to talk about the, what the actual study says. So the actual study design intervention is um, the protocol included a one-month run-in period where participants were instructed to maintain their habitual diet, physical activity, and body weight. The intervention involved 22 instructional sessions held over 12 months in diet-specific groups. Sessions were held weekly for eight weeks, then every two weeks for two months, then every three weeks until the sixth month, and monthly and monthly thereafter. Classes were led by five registered dietitian health educators who each taught one healthy low-fat class and one healthy low-carb class per cohort. So first off, um, that is a behavioral intervention and 22 sessions over a year in of itself is a way of creating accountability and support beyond just what to eat. So the JAMA article um, does not describe the specific dietary interventions and instead refers the reader to another study, another article about the study which goes into more details about the methods. Um, the diet fit study um, diet intervention examining the factors interacting with treatment success study design and methods which is found in contemporary clinical trials um, you know and it's it's really it's not unusual uh, when you have a large well-funded study to publish multiple articles and to have one focus on the methodology um, the, the, the JAMA article that's being cited um, in the New York Times article is really kind of looking, um, I, I'm not I'm really going to get into it, but about um, insulin and a lot of the, the clinical testing, they did, like laboratory testing they did, genetics. I mean, I'm not really going to get into it because basically the conclusion was that none of it mattered. So I don't really feel the need to dig into that because that's basically like, oh, this thing we thought would show an association didn't show any association. Um, anyway, so in explaining how the classes were run, um, they explain keeping the classes exclusive in this manner was done with the intention of maximizing overall engagement and retention through the promotion of social cohesion, comfort, and privacy, and the minimalization of vulnerability 
vulnerability, i.e. avoiding newcomers in the class, among class members. So this is a focus on the psychosocial, you know, as I said before. So I'm going to read a fairly long excerpt describing how the dietary intervention worked. And yes, food quality is a portion of it, but you be the judge of whether or not it is the only component that should be noted. Okay. There were three central components to the dietary strategy that were repeatedly and consistently communicated to participants regardless of diet assignment. The first was go as low as you can go, limbo strategy for the first eight weeks. Participants were instructed to progressively cut back on fat or carbohydrate intake until they had achieved a daily intake of no more than 20 grams of fat or carbohydrate per day depending on their group assignment. Participants received explicit instructions that, rate, um, the, that the rate of restriction was not critical to the study and that reaching the 20 grams per day in 2 versus 4 versus 6 versus 8 weeks was not considered to carry any advantage or disadvantage. Therefore, their rate could be variable and individually tailored. The instructions were also a clear statement that even though 20 grams per day was the objective, any individuals who were unable to reach those low levels were, would not be dropped from the study or considered to be non-compliant. Rather, the expectation was more, consi was more consistent with the concept of the party game Limbo. Go as low as you can go. Once participants reached the lowest level, their lowest level of fat or carbohydrate intake, um, they were encouraged to maintain that level for at least a few weeks. There were no sp specific time uh, for maintaining the lowest level. Rather, it was explained to participants that the goal was to, to provide them with the personal experience of being anchored at the lowest level they could achieve and maintain at least for a week or two. The second component of the dietary strategy, titrate, involved instructing participants to slowly add fat or carbohydrates back to their diet in increments of 5 to 15 grams per day. For periods of a week at a time with no set endpoint goal for a specific level of, car of fat or carbohydrate. For example, participants who achieved 20 grams per day within the first 8 weeks and then maintained that level for a few weeks were encouraged to shift their daily goal to 25 to 35 grams per day for a week or for possibly more than a week. During this process, they were instructed to assess how the increased level of fat or carbohydrate affected both their satisfaction with their daily intake, e.g. Um, um, satiety, um, palatability, and enjoyment, and their weight loss progress. If satisfaction and weight loss progress were acceptable, they had the option of maintaining that level of fat or carbohydrate intake for another week or adding incremental 5 to 15 grams per day. Importantly, while participants were encouraged to slowly add fat or carbohydrate to their diet in this manner, it was also made clear that they should not add back more than would be necessary to keep them at the lowest possible level over the long term, while sim simultaneously addressing any concerns about long-term satisfaction in areas related to sa uh, satiety, um, palatability, and enjoyment. After adding back uh, the designated grams per day, they could also consider reversing that decision and reduce their intake based on factors mentioned above. At this point, they could maintain that level for the remainder of the study or try to add back small amounts of fat or carbohydrate later in the study. Thus, for the purpose of the overall guidance, this titrate component of the dietary strategy was described to participants as having the ultimate objective of having each one of them eventually find their individualized level of fat or carbohydrate that was both the lowest they could achieve and the lowest they could conceivably maintain for years to come after the 12-month um, protocol ended. Inherent in this approach was the idea that the f final level of fat or carbohydrate intake achieved among individuals within both diet arms would vary substantially with no single set target of for fat or carbohydrate. It was explained to participants that this was 
uh, acceptable to the study researchers and even to be expected to due to the central study hypothesis that each of the study diets would be easier for some participants and more difficult for others based on some combination of gen genetic and, me and or metabolic predispositions. It was for these reasons that one diet does not fit all was the name of the study used by research, the research team for communication with participants. The third component of the overall dietary strategy was promoting high dietary quality um, for both food for both groups for the full 12 month intervention. Optimizing diet quality was emphasized by giving both diet groups similar instructions to focus on. Uh, whole real foods that were mostly prepared at home when possible, specifically included as many vegetables as possible every day. However, they liked them grilled, stir-fried, ro uh, roasted. Um, they were also encouraged to choose lean, grass-fed, and pasture-raised animals, as well as sustainable fish. With a focus on consuming whole, real foods, both groups were likewise instructed to eliminate as much as possible processed foods, including those with added sugars, refined flours, um, products, or trans fats. Participants were encouraged to prepare as much of their own food as possible and to optimize the inclusion of fresh seasonal foods. When eating out or traveling, they were encouraged to ask for modifications to standard menu items and to help them adhere to their diet assignment, you know, e.g. ordering salad dressing on the side for the healthy low-fat group or a side of greens instead of mashed potatoes for the healthy um, low-carb group. Um, so I'm just going to pause for a second in reading this and adjust, uh, address the fact that, so obviously we're getting to this, this third portion, which is looking at diet quality, but the first components of how low can you go and then titration are, you know, all about learning how to restrict and how to introduce um, something like fat or carbs into the diet. So, you know, I, this just again sticks out to me so strongly that like to focus just on the food quality misses the whole point where, where there was this reduction and then titration up to like a maintainable level. Um, I, I just find it baffling that there's only a focus on the quality of food. Anyway, I'm going to read the rest. Um, several of the topics related to quality were specific to each of the two different diet assignments. Those assigned to healthy, low-fat uh, were instructed to choose whole grain foods, uh, e.g. rather than whole wheat flour products, including steel-cut oats, farro, barley, quinoa, brown rice, and wild rice. Healthy, low-fat participants were encouraged to explore and consume a wide range of legumes and beans, fresh fruit, low-fat dairy products, and lean meats. Those assigned to healthy, low-carb were instructed to choose high-quality oils and fats, avocados, hard cheeses, nut butters, and nuts and seeds. During the titrate phase and throughout the remainder of the 12-month protocol, as the healthy low-fat group added small, um, small amounts of fat back to their diet, and as healthy low-carb group added small amounts of carbohydrate back to their diet, they were instructed to do so with the same high-quality foods. Given that high-quality foods can be more expensive um, than are similar in than foods that are similar in type, but lower in quality, the encouragement to choose quality was framed as a continuum as opposed to an either-or. E.g., for the healthy, low-fat participants, organic wheat berries was as the highest level of quality, followed by conventional wheat berries. Then, whole wheat um, bread made with a minimal number of ingredients and no additives. Then, a more conventional whole wheat bread with many ingredients, including additives. And finally, refined white uh, flour bread with many ingredients and additives was considered the lowest end of the quality continuum. In other words, participants were encouraged to choose the highest quality foods they could reasonably find, realistically afford, and enjoy. In summary, the diet strategy for both the healthy low-fat and healthy low-carb group was limbo titrate quality approach, with the goal of having participants achieve an individualized lowest possible level of fat or carbohydrate intake for maximal dietary in, uh, quality. 
and one that could be conceived of, uh, conceivably be maintained for long term beyond the end of the 12 month protocol. Notably, there were no specific caloric restriction goals for either the, the diet and no single specific percentage of fat or carbohydrate to which they were told to strive as their final goal. Um, okay, so, okay, again, getting back to the head, you know, the conceit that this was not about reducing calories, it was about food quality, um, which, you know, they just emphasize, you know, however, you, uh, one thing that comes to mind is that, you know, if you... <laughs> Grams of fat and grams of carbohydrate um, are correlated with specific calorie amounts. So restricting to 20 grams is restricting to a certain number of calories. Now, you know, it could be argued, well, that's not saying that everything else is being restricted. I mean, that's true, but I think... I think it is a safe thing to say that very few people overeat spinach. Um, I also think it's a fairly safe thing to say that very few people overeat chicken breast. Um, you know, these are foods that are really hard to overconsume. Whereas carbohydrates um, and fats are the things that are that are easy to overconsume. Um, it's much easier to you know to eat too many nuts or to eat a lot of bread than it is to eat, you know, just mass qualities of vegetables or lean protein. I mean, I'm not saying it's impossible, but it's just harder. So what, I mean, what they're basically doing is they're training people how to limit um, a type of food that is, it's much, that's easy to, to consume, to overconsume, basically. That's all I'm saying. That there was inherent in this a form of of calorie restriction. It just wasn't um, necessarily like framed in that way. Okay. So let's play a game. I'm going to read more innervation, inter information about the intervention and see how many components you can name besides food quality. Ready? Go. Overall, there were four main foci of instructional session, sessions. Nutrition, behavior, emotions, and physical activity. While well, all of these were unusually were usually touched upon in each class, nutrition was the was typically the primary focus, and one other com, um, component per class was highlighted and explored in more detail. The nutrition focus was strongest in the first two months of the 12-month protocol, after which more and more emphasis was given to non-dietary components of the sessions, and these were relatively similar in many regards for the two inter intervention groups. Specific class topics taught to both diet groups included mindful eating, food and mood, sleep and weight, food addiction, exercise, as well as tips and demonstrations on shopping, preparing, and cooking vegetables. All health educators taught their classes through the lens of helping participants to focus on making sustainable lifestyle changes, not simply on following a temporary diet. Because the classroom instruction, each health educator was available to offer individual contact with their, um, their class members via email and phone e.g. ranging from several times a week to very rarely, to address specific dietary questions and review food logs. Ding, 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 ding. Um, so record scratch, food logs, addressing food addiction, community support, individual support, exercise, among others. They also were given pedometers as a way to encourage self-monitoring of activity. Whew. All right, let's hear more. While the initial eight class sessions were focused mostly on nutritional knowledge and understanding what the food changes would be, the majority of the remaining class sessions were focused on how to put this knowledge into practice. The behavior modification strategies 
were based on a social cognitive model which views behavior, including health behaviors, as acquired and maintained through a complex set of behavioral, cognitive, and environmental conditions. Social cognition intervention strategies have been found to be effective in prompting adoption or retention of a number of lifestyle intervention studies with a range of adult populations. Health educators uh, exposed participants to empirically supported principles of self-regulatory behavior change, e.g., goal setting, self-efficacy building, supportive environments, healthful self-reinforcement and rewards, relapse prevention. Class themes that addressed food behavior included the power of habit, the practice of mindful eating, how emotions drive food decisions, the concept of bulk cooking, grocery shopping, meal planning, meal timing, dining out, and more. The impact of participants' surrounding environments and contacts, e.g. at work, at home, and, f and with friends, and how to deal with the pressures that might derail them were also discussed in detail. <sighs> wow. So again, to not include that in, in this article, I, I just find really, really troubling. Because again, this idea that you could just, you know, eat high quality food but not address this like wide range of of um, cognitive um, behaviors and the social cognition model like I mean this, they it's really quite robust it's really impressive that they were covering so many um, practices that were you know research based so like they're doing this really all-encompassing thing beyond the just, you know, eating good food. Okay, I'm almost done here. I'm sorry if, I, if, if it feels like I've been focusing too much on the actual text, but I, I feel like I tried to excerpt, you know, to summarize some of this, but I felt like, you know, the excerpts themselves do a pretty good job of explaining um, what was going on. Uh, okay, so study participants employed a variety of methods to self-monitor adherence to their diet group assignment through the, throughout the study particularly in the first eight weeks when the goal was to lower dietary fat and or carbohydrate depending on assignment to 20 grams per day the most common dietary monitoring method used was the online my fitness powell tool many of the participants indicated experience with this tool prior to study, starting the study and most participants used it for who used it for the first time reported general satisfaction with its ease of use participants uh, were able to share access access of their MyFitnessPal results with their health educators, who were then able to review entries as needed to help guide participants in their diet adherence. Other methods used by, the, um, by those preferring an alternative approach included a paper food log provided by the health educators or one of the several web-based tracking tools that are similar to MyFitnessPal, e.g. MyNetDiary and LoseIt. Wow. So, you know, self-monitoring is one thing. Self-monitoring, knowing that experts will be reviewing what you ate, seems like an intensifier of self-monitoring. So basically, this study involved a wraparound approach of diet, emotional, and psychological tools, self-monitoring techniques, support systems, accountability, and so on. Yes! eating so-called high-quality food was a part of it, but so was this. Despite not being instructed to follow a specific energy in intake restriction, the mean reported energy intake reduction relative to baseline was about 500 to 600 calories per day for both groups at each time point after randomization. So all the factors I listed in conjunction with high quality food, which is less calorie dense than lower quality, cheaper foods, um, produced a deficit. Of course, the higher quality made it easier, but the study des um, describes that they had a very specific protocol about reducing fat or carbs. So like, I mean, can we just not forget the fact that they're eating 500 to 600 calories less a day? Like really let that sink in. And that's not included in the New York Times article. Like, 
I mean, I guess what I'm trying to say is like, you know, a takeaway I can see is eating high quality food makes it easier to make that deficit. And, you know, not even focusing on it, they were still able to do it. But they definitely were focusing very specifically on um, the fat or carbs, depending on their group, which, and, you know, again, those fat grams have a calorie correlation. So, <sighs> I'm sorry, it just makes me so aggravated to act as if, you know, that wasn't happening. So, I, I think the reason why the New York Times article is so aggravating, aggravating to me is, you know, it's, it's twofold. It has this elitist implication of if you just go to Whole Foods and buy good food, that's all you have to do. Which is like, what about the majority of people who struggle with their weight who can't do that simply by ponying up more money because it's not an option? And second, it's just not true. The study study's authors don't say that, and the study design doesn't say that, and the point of the study is that there are a lot of factors that contribute to weight loss um, but don't worry about your genotype or um, or stress out about low fat versus low carb. Um, the a- actual diet of both groups is mostly made up of fruits, vegetables, and lean protein. So, um, you know, do that, then add whichever you prefer. You know, be that a slice of wheat toast or you know, a bowl of oatmeal or a small amount of nuts or avocado. Yeah, you know, which is a liberating thing to hear um, without... Th- but without the cadre of behavioral and cognitive supports and education, a just eat high quality food approach may not help a lot of people in the long term. Um, the study doesn't look at which specific supports were important because they're building on numerous other studies um, that said they're, they're important already. Um, I can't help but think that self monitoring also produced the calorie deficit, not just the food. I mean, imagine knowing you're going to have to tell an expert what you ate in the last 24 hours. It might seriously give you pause. It's very disingenuous to act like just because calorie reduction wasn't a specific goal or demand of the researchers, that it isn't happening. People weren't given a calorie target, but a lot of tools that help them to reach a lower one. I mean, seriously, imagine that. Imagine you're recording all the food you eat, and you know that it any moment you might get a call and be asked to say what you ate in the last 24 hours or you know you're submitting it on a regular basis and you I mean you might not have that pizza slice you may not do that extra thing um so yeah thumb down thumbs down to that New York Times article it really missed the point it misrepresented the results and I think it provided a a possibly very world view affirming perspective for some people, but not a critique or analysis. I mean, I, I guess, you know, I said it was twofold, but maybe it's threefold. Maybe it's the like, I think what really bothers me is that there's something like it's really telling you what you want to hear, which is like you don't need to think about any of this stuff. You don't need to address any sorts of, um, emotional or psychological um, or just like you know real issues underneath any of this you know you don't need to think about it you don't need to write it down you don't need to do anything you just need to go to Whole Foods and I don't think it's true I don't think the research shows it and but I can see why it's a very appealing takeaway because who doesn't want to hear that it's all I mean, we all love simple answers. You know, all you have to do is just spend a lot of money. And obviously spending a lot of money helps for real. But that's not, that's just not the whole truth. It's not even a big part of the truth. Okay. So, you know, I think at this point I... You know, I th- feel like I've provided um, a lot of research that explains why tracking um, or self-monitoring is really helpful um, to a lot of people and like why that that is a part of what weight my, uh, maintenance. Um, but I'm going to talk about eating disorders and tracking you know, slash self-monitoring. So 
so I am shifting to the eating disorder portion of the podcast. Um, so recording food intake and physical activity and obsessive weight monitoring are things that many people with eating disorders do. Um, they might have even picked these up uh, you know, as habits from legitimate sources that were based on solid research findings like the ones I discussed. And the problem is at some point the disorder takes over and these habits become pathological. So just like um, how washing your hands is generally a helpful thing, but in combination with OCD, it's really harmful. This is why a person who has struggled with an eating disorder in the past needs to be aware that engaging in self-monitoring, even from a pro-health standpoint, could be harmful to them. I think about it this like, you know, if you're a person who's been in a lot of you know, multiple toxic romantic relationships, like bad relationships. And if they asked if it was possible to date again, or must they be alone for the rest of their lives? Well, of course they can date again. But they probably need to employ a lot of best practices that probably everybody should do, but they can usually get away get away without doing. Um, so they might need to work on, with a therapist to coach them and develop strategies for creating personal boundaries, you know, like identifying red flags, etc. They might um, impose rules for themselves, like delaying physical intimacy longer than they really want to, in order to get to know their potential partner better. Um, They might have friends meet and greet a potential person so they can get some additional feedback. They might categorically avoid certain types of people that have been problematic in the past. I mean, the point is they can probably do the thing, but they need to be extremely mindful as they do it so they don't create a personal tragedy. Um, So is it impossible for a person who has struggled with disordered eating to use tracking as a method to change their body composition in a healthy way and maintain their weight? No. Is it something that should be approached very carefully? Yes. And I would suggest talking to a professional to help develop, you know, the needed strategies before even considering it. I mean, not me. I'm not a mental health professional. However, you know, the Supreme Court ruled that giving up inaccurate medical information without training or qualification is in fact covered by the First Amendment. So technically, I can't actually can give out medical advice legally if I believe something hard enough. But I'm not going to because that is bonkers and wrong. You know, I would also suggest talking to folks at um, NEDA, um, the National Eating Disorders Association, which you can also get more information at the uh, www.nationaleatingdisorders.org. But, and this is a major but, If you are in any way risking your recovery, absolutely do not use tracking if it is a trigger for you. Just don't. It's not worth it in any way. Eating disorders are deadly and life-wrecking. There are other ways to improve your health. And, you know, try those first. I mean, like I said, don't. Just don't do it unless you have a lot of support and a lot of resources and you have, um, you know, a qualified person giving you an okay that this is something that you should attempt. Okay, so now I'm going to shift away from that. So despite the very robust robust evidence of um, the effectiveness of food tracking and the wide dissemination of this particular strategy, it is often met with resistance. I know this not um, from published studies, but from some qualitative data I have collected by observing in various online forums. Now, obviously, for every per- every person um, brings up a post, there is probably a lot of people on the forum who just lurk silently. But this topic incites so very many comments. People know they should or because somebody, an expert, has told them that it'll help, but they don't want to, and they are looking for alternatives or ways to make it less painful. People talk about how they got past their own resistance as well. 
The research makes it clear that self-monitoring is a trait of weight maintainers. But for many people, food is about so many emotional and psychological factors, not the least of which is control. You know, resisting being told what to do, possibly because they can't exert control in other areas of their lives. The shame of confronting their own behavior because of a moral value placed on food and eating behaviors um, are also kind of chief factors. You know, this is not to say these are the only factors. Certainly there are many people that because of structural issues like transportation, living in food deserts, income is huge disability, etc., you know, they aren't in great positions to make food choices, so tracking might seem irrelevant. However, this is not the case for, for these vocal resistors. They complain about how much time it takes, which is an argument I would push back on for two reasons. One is that with an app and a smartphone, it takes seconds. Caloric value is already input, inputted and the the barcodes can be scanned easily, especially after weeks um, where frequently eaten foods are already listed. It takes so much less time compared with other phone behaviors, it barely seems relevant. Um, second, I think that part of the resistance and complaint about time burden really stems from a feeling of unfairness. It is not fair that some people have to consciously monitor their food intake while others don't. Or at least they don't appear like, they, it, it doesn't appear like they do. And it's especially not fair that it needs to be a lifelong habit. A whole lifetime is such a grind. This way of thinking reminds me of how I can drink a glass of wine and stop with no problem. Seriously, sometimes a glass of wine is really nice. Sometimes two glasses are really nice. Very rarely three are nice. But pretty much never do I go beyond that. You know, for whatever genetic or psychosocial reasons, I'm really good at monitoring my drinking. And drinking to excess is not a problem for me. I don't even really think about it. I just sort of know, oh, that's enough. And I stop. I go weeks without drinking anything and never even think about it. This is not true for some people. I recommend a really excellent HBO documentary called Risky Drinking that presents a huge amount of research on alcohol consumption and alcoholism. You know, some people from the first sip have a problem with drinking and nothing except for total abstinence can help them. But for others, Alcoholism is better understood as a spectrum disorder, where disordered drinking over time produces alcoholism. E.g., the wine mommy and the party girl weekend binger are not necessarily doomed to become alcoholics, although they might become them, um, if there are specific behavioral interventions such as learning self-monitoring strategies. You know, like using an app to record how much they've drank and learning about true portion size. You know, that Long Island iced tea is not one drink, it's five. A serving of wine in our modern wine glasses um, is, is much more than what is actually considered a serving, which is five ounces. Uh, and also, a measly five ounces is the serving size, not the bottle. It's not fair that I don't need to use an app to keep track of how much I drink. And it's not fair that some people need to. It's not fair that some people can't drink at all and need to use the accountability strategy of regular meetings. It is just the reality that we face. Again, yeah, it's, it's not fair that some people, either because of their biology or psychological tools or how they grew up or how much money they have or what country they live in, you know, are able to self-monitor their food intake in, in, unconsciously. And it's not fair that some people do need to self-monitor. But it is a very potent strategy. As I said at the beginning, despite strong trends. There is nothing that 100% of people of the NWCR do. There is diversity in their success. But 
98% modify food intake, and, and tracking food is a big part of that for many people. So if you need some tools for weight maintenance um, and are not in peril of slipping into a disordered eating, tracking is a good thing to consider. And if you are resistant to that, maybe look at that resistance and where it comes from. So that brings us to the end today. Bottom line, if you need to lose weight or need to help maintaining it, tracking your food intake is an easy and effective tool. Unless you have a history of eating disorders, in which case you should not attempt to change your body composition without legit qualified mental health professionals supporting you. Please, if you found this episode helpful or interesting, uh, like, rate, review, and subscribe to the podcast. Share any way you can on your social media form of choice or with your mouth. Um, that's also a very effective strategy to use your mouth to tell other people. Um, follow me on Twitter at maintaining slash positivity. Um, go to the Podbean site, and that's Podbean like like a bean pod, except it's Podbean, like magical beans, Podbean. And follow me there at maintainingpositivity.podbean.com. You can also follow my blog at maintainingpositivity.home.blog, where I try to post more things like interesting articles that I don't always have time to cover in the podcast. Thanks so much for listening.